Good morning, shalom everyone, and welcome to the ancient city of Joppa. It's, uh, it's a name that only in English uh, sounds weird, uh, Joppa. In Hebrew, by the way, it's not called Joppa, it's called Yafo. It comes from the Hebrew word beautiful. Yafa is beautiful, Yafe, beautiful. And there's no doubt that the name reflects the nature of this place. It is definitely beautiful. We're talking about a city located right on the shores of the Mediterranean. And we're about 30 miles south of Caesarea by the sea along the Mediterranean. And this is the, one of the most ancient harbors at uh, the time of the Old, of course, and the New Testament. When we deal with Caesarea by the sea, we'll talk about it obviously with New Testament angle. This is no doubt an ancient Old Testament city that is first mentioned in the writings of Thotmes III, one of the pharaohs that had a conquest um, journey all the way here in the land of Israel, 15th century before Christ. We're, we're talking about more than 3,500 years ago that the name of this place is already mentioned in the ancient Egyptian writings. So the fact that it's mentioned 1,500 years before Christ doesn't mean that it's only 3,500 years old. It's much even older than that. But you can see that it is so important and it is so old that it is already mentioned in the writings of 3,500 years ago. Definitely an amazing place. Today, about 60,000 people live here in this city, predominantly Jewish of a Middle Eastern um, and North African descent. But it is also, there is a sizable uh, Arab uh, community that lives here as well. It's one of those mixed cities. We've got four mixed cities in, in Israel today that are having both Jewish and Arab population living side by side peacefully. We've got Jerusalem, we've got um, Joppa, we've got Haifa, and we've got Beersheba. Um, and Joppa, of course, is a symbol of coexistence here in the land of Israel. Um, Joppa, by the way, is one city together with Tel Aviv. It's, there's one mayor over Tel Aviv and Joppa. In, in fact, the name of Tel Aviv is Tel Aviv Joppa. That's the name of the city if you go to uh, check on you know, the official website. Now, when we talk about this particular city, we need to remember that this particular location is basically one of the oldest functioning harbors in the world. And uh, we're talking about it's a harbor today for fishing boats, but in the ancient times, even Solomon used this particular harbor to bring the cedar, uh, the cedars from Lebanon floating all the way from Lebanon along the coast and then brought from this place all the, all the way up to Jerusalem. In fact, this was the nearest harbor to Jerusalem. And that's why Jerusalem and Joppa enjoys a very interesting connection to the point that the, one of the most important streets in Jerusalem is Jaffa Street with the Jaffa Gate uh, in the old city. And one of the most important streets in Jaffa is the Jerusalem Boulevard. You see the connection between the cities. Now, we're talking about um, a place where we, all, we have Old Testament and New Testament events, of course. And uh, the lesson we want to study today here in this city is related to the tribal allotment, basically, of uh, this particular place, and uh, as well as for two particular people who were originally from Galilee, but ended up right here for various reasons. So we're talking about a tribe, and we're talking about two people, Old Testament and New Testament figures. Both from Galilee, both ended up right here in this place. The tribe we're talking about is the tribe of Dan, and the people we're talking about is Jonah the prophet and Peter, Simon Peter, the fisherman from Galilee. So, first of all, um, I want us all to remember that um, disobedience is something that goes all the way back to Genesis 3. 
we can clearly see that um, the biggest downfall of the, human of the human race is actually the lack of simple obedience. Simple obedience. And to, to what? To the commandments of the Lord. And what happened is, uh, the serpent could see that and he attacked right there. And basically, what we see here is that God asked a simple request and that was enough to see that the attitude is not thy will, but my will be done, basically. And when, when we look at Jesus saying, not my will, but thy will be done, you see why God loved his son so much. You see, this is my beloved son. In fact, the one component that from the very beginning separated us not only from the presence of God, but from the love of God, was the lack of obedience. Which means the one thing that can bring us back to the presence of God and to the love of God is simple obedience. Just like Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. So it's very interesting to see how we go all the way back to the tribe of Dan. Dan was the oldest son of Jacob from his maid, from his, uh, um, I would call it um, his slave, Bilha. And that tribe that later on came out of the person of Dan was one of Israel's largest tribes. And how do I know that? Because we know that in Numbers 1, 39, we're talking about 62,700 fighting men that came out of the tribe of Dan, second only to the tribe of Judah, that in, 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 in verse 27 had 74,600 fighting men. So the second largest tribe in Israel, the firstborn of Jacob, you would expect much from him. You would expect much from people who carry that type of, of, of um, heritage. And then we, we, we can clearly see that Dan was, was fighting. In fact, uh, he led one of the four major divisions who, who could protect uh, the people in Numbers 2.31. We can see that. And Dan was a tribe that produced at least one of the most important uh, um, judges of Israel. And that was Samson. Now, we all know the story of Samson, and we're going to talk about Samson when we go to the valley of Sorah, where Samson was born and where he grew up. All he needed to do is cross the Sorek Valley and enter the city of the Philistines called Timna and find their uh, Delilah. But we don't want to talk about Samson. We just want to talk about the importance of the tribe of Dan. But the tribe of Dan had a problem. And the problem goes back to disobedience. God gave them a tribal allotment. And I have a question for you. When God gives you something, whether it's ministry, whether it's a spouse, whether it's children, you know, God gives you children. You don't choose them, trust me. When God gives you parents, in-laws, when God gives you church members, friends, when God gives you wealth, when God gives you so many things in your life, then most likely, if it's from God, these are the things that you need to have. And they will play a significant role in various chapters in your life. And trust me, I come from family background where I am asking God almost every day, why did you give me this mother and this father? And, and why do I have, you know, certain things in my life? But I learn in my short life that there are certain things that sometimes only in Heinz view, only when we look back, we understand then why God gave us those people and that, that thing and, 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 and being in this situation. Of course, it's a big difference between us disobeying God and walking and finding ourselves in situations we're not supposed to. And that's obviously not God given. And then we have to suffer the consequences. But the tribe of Dan was given a territory. <laughs> I'm always saying if they only knew 
that the territory that they were given is today the hottest piece of real estate in the entire Middle East, if they only knew that. But of course they didn't. What did they know? They were looking at things through the eyes of circumstances. And may I say, circumstances are probably the most dangerous thing to lean on and to build your entire understanding of God's will for your life because circumstances are just circumstances. And we're going to see that in a few minutes. Circumstances that even the, the uh, apostles found themselves in and thank God they didn't think that God wants them dead. But think about it. The tribe of Dan was situated between the Mediterranean on the west, the Philistines in the south, the tribe of Judah on the east, the tribe of Benjamin in the north. They felt trapped. And why is it that they felt trapped? Because for them, there was a pride and there was a fear that both played a big role. The pride is that we do not want to have Judah and Benjamin standing right above us, towering above us on the mountains and the hills, and the fear from the Philistines. Now, if God gives you territory, if God led you out of the land of bondage, through the desert, into the promised land, would God bring you all the way to a tribal allotment that is going to basically bring about your destruction? Obviously not. It's interesting, but the one thing that brought about destruction over the tribe of Dan was their disobedience by changing the territory that they lived in. Exchanging that which was given by God with what, that which was chosen by men. So Dan disobeyed God and Dan abandoned their territory, God-given territory, and moved up north to the northernmost border of Israel, thinking that they find a place safe, secure, lush and green, not understanding that the, when the coming destruction over the kingdom of, of, of Israel is coming, that will be the first place that will be destroyed. That which looked at the time safe, secure, lush and green, nice and peaceful, happened or, or was discovered to be um, the course and the cause of their destruction. So that's as far as the tribe of Dan disobeying God and moving to the wrong territory. And yes, I agree, having the Philistines on one hand, the tribe of Judah on the other hand, and you know, this is where we need to trust God for protection. This is where we need to trust God in, in situations. You know, following God's calling upon your life requires not only obedience, but a lot of trust and a lot of um, um, uh, prayer. And I can only quote you two verses from the New Testament showing that circumstances at the time for the disciples were not that great. And if it wasn't for trust, and if it wasn't for prayer, and it wasn't for great faith, obviously circumstances, circumstances would, would have brought them down. In 2 Corinthians, in 1, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raised the dead. It's amazing. The disciples found themselves in danger of death. It's not just a, uh, you know, I'm not having peaceful life, I'm not having rich life, I'm not having friendly uh, people around me. I am about to die. And they learn not to trust themselves, but to trust God, the same God who raised even the dead. And in James 1, 2 through 8, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. 
If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in his ways. God wants pure faith. And it's not the type of faith of name it and claim it. Of I want a blue Volvo and a black Mercedes and, and, and I, I'm claiming it. And No, that's not the faith that God is talking about here. We're talking about faith in the calling of God upon your life. Faith in the purpose of life that God gives you. Not faith in the possessions that you want to have because of your eyes and your heart. So these are important things that we must, we must understand. Now, the judgment over the disobedience of Dan for abandoning their inheritance and adopting pagan idolatry introduced to them by Jeroboam in their temple at the city of Dan was basically a double one. So you understand, moving from their original inheritance all the way up to the northern part of the land and, and later on building a temple, a false temple, and having, believe it or not, a golden calf introduced to them as Jehovah who brought them out of Egypt. That was an amazing thing. The first thing is that the tribe was defeated by the Assyrians attack between 722 and 723 BC. In the book of Revelation chapter 7, we see the list of the tribes of Israel from which 144,000 sealed servants of God should come and Dan is not even mentioned there. So it was a double judgment here. And you can see that your disobedience today can affect generations later on. For them at the moment, they were destroyed physically. But for their future generations, they were deprived such a privilege even in the future time when God is going to use Jewish people from the tribes of Israel to minister to the world during the tribulation, when we are all gone. There will be only the work of evangelism done by these people. I count it as an amazing privilege that my own people who reject God and Jesus today will be the main tool God is going to use to evangelize the gospel of Jesus Christ during the tribulation. Can you imagine the same people of Israel that do not accept Jesus today will be the chief evangelists during the tribulation. Now I, I think that <laughs> I would be so proud to be part of that, although I, I thank God I'm not going to be part of that. Being a Christian today means I'm going to be raptured and that the same with all of you. However, you never know today when you reach out to a Jewish person, when you, when you talk to a person um, you know, of either Israel or the Jewish uh, diaspora around the world, when you talk to them about Jesus, I'm going to tell you something. You're sowing a seed that you may not even understand what it's going to bring forth. There's a good chance that your conversation with that Jew today might produce an evangelist during the tribulation. You understand what we're talking about? Talking to the Jews about Jesus not only is permissible, it is a must. A, because we want them to be saved. B, because we are actually sowing the seed of faith that once we're gone, they will see, oh, that which that man told me, it is true. And faith will be birthed in their heart and they will become amazing servants of God. You know, the Bible says in the book of Romans that now the Jewish people worship with zeal, but without knowledge thinking that their own righteousness will come from their own deeds and their own, uh, uh, you know, keeping of the law and other things. However, I want you to know, the Bible says in the book of Romans, in chapter 11, 
if their fall is riches to the world, how much more their acceptance is going to be, if not life from the dead. Which means that that same Jew, who now is completely blind to the understanding of the gospel and the salvation of, through Jesus Christ, the minute it clicks, the minute he understands, that zeal will now be connected to the knowledge and it will be like life from the dead. And, and, and you just produce without even knowing. One of the main evangelists in the time of the Great Tribulation. And how sad it is that the tribe of Dan is not even mentioned. That privilege of being part of the most amazing thing, one of the most amazing chapters in history, is deprived from them. Why? Because of their disobedience. So I, I want to encourage you when we talk about obedience, not only to think about yourself, but think about generations to come. Think about that which God can produce from your obedience and that which you can deprive from future generations because of your disobedience. It's interesting because um, leaving the tribe of Dan and moving to the, the two characters we wanted to talk about when we talk about a lesson in obedience, we first talk about Jonah. Jonah comes from the area of Nazareth of today. And uh, the Bible calls his town Gat Hefer, which is right the outskirts of Nazareth of today. So Jonah is a Galilean Jew. We first having, have Jonah mentioned in 2 Kings 14.25. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, God sends Jonah in the book of Jonah to a mission. It's very interesting because oftentimes God is telling us to do things that we're not comfortable doing. And, and think about it. Jonah was called to the city of Nineveh, one of the largest cities in the ancient world, in Iraq of today. Thousands upon thousands of people, huge city even in today's proportions. Jonah is sent to a city full of sin, a city full of death, a city full of idolatries, paganism. It's almost like Jonah will be sent to New York City today. But think about it, it's Iraq. Now, Jonah says to himself, I don't want to go to Iraq. I have a question. Would you want to go to Iraq right now? Well, Jonah had the same feeling. I really don't want to go there. First of all, pagans, sinners, idol worshippers, it's not my culture. It's, it, everything that is not me and who I am, I don't want to go there. If I need to go, I'd rather go to Spain rather than Iraq. I don't blame him, by the way. <laughs> if you ask me, Spain, Iraq, Spain, Spain. Jonah thinks, okay, I I'm going to just disappear. God will just have to find me. So he comes all the way down to the port of Joppa, which is the ancient harbor of that time. And, and he, he gets on a boat. And we all know that the boat heads towards Tarshish. Tarshish is the area of Spain today. We know that in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, it speaks of the merchants of Tarshish and the young lions of Tarshish. And we know that Western Europe, basically, is, is, is identified as the merchants of Tarshish. And that which came out of Western Europe, which I believe is America, the young lions of Tarshish, is also mentioned there. And so we can clearly see the human preference of the West over the East, of that culture over that culture. And Jonah we all know is going to the wrong direction. Now, God did not stop him from walking down to the harbor, not even from getting on that boat. But at some point, Jonah had to understand that he's doing a major, major mistake. Normally, when we don't follow the Lord and run away from him, we also try to run away from the people of God and from the places of God. Every time we kind of run away from God and we rebel against God, 
the presence of the people of God actually is a problem for us. And the, the presence or us being in the place of God, the house of God is a problem for us. Oftentimes when someone lives in sin, he won't go to church and he, he won't even communicate with friends that are believers. So Jonah is running away from the calling. What happens when you don't walk in the ways of God, then comes shame and guilt. That's what happened to Adam and Eve, you know. They knew they did something wrong. And so when God came and walked in the garden, where were they? Hiding. Now, can, can you hide from God? Of course not. But that was a token of shame and guilt. I'm telling you, when you're hiding something, not 90%, 100% it's a wrong thing, if you're hiding it. And so, we, we, we speak of Jonah trying to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord in Jonah 1, 3. From the presence of the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 139, verses 7 and 8, David writes from his own experience, Where could I go to escape from your spirit or from your sight? If I were to climb up to the highest heavens, you would be there. If I were to dig down to the world of the dead, you would also be there. You cannot escape from the presence of God. You can try. You can try to run away. And this is exactly the story of Peter. Jonah ended up being in the belly of the fish and the fish almost in the Hebrew, it's almost like vomited mm -hmm. right at the coast of Joppa. Once again, can you imagine he, he left Joppa dressed nicely and he came back to Joppa <laughs> smelling not good. That's how you're going to smell if you go to the world. You're going to be back and God will receive you, but you're going to smell terribly. You're going to a very bad place. And God graciously corrected him and brought him back. And Jonah is now ready to obey. We can summarize the book of Jonah in eight words. Jonah, go, no, whoa. Jonah, go, yes, grace. Jonah got it and he went there. And the product of one person's ministry caused great and amazing revival in a sinful city. That was just one city in one country of, and, and the effort of one person who was, by the way, living in those days of the Old Testament where the presence of the Holy Spirit was pretty limited because no one was really sealed with the Holy Ghost. People had the, the, the Spirit of God falling upon them. The Greek term is epi, upon. But the Holy Spirit would also leave you. That's, that's exactly why David in Psalm 51 begs that God will not take the Holy Spirit from him. Because it was a possibility. And David understood, I cannot function, I cannot do, I cannot run, I cannot breathe without the Holy Spirit of God. So we're, we're talking about Jonah with a limited capacity of the Holy Spirit. Went all the way to one country, to one city, and God made unbelievable things. Now we move to another person in the New Testament who was sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that person was above and beyond the limitation of one city, one country, in one area. It is Peter, Simon Peter, Shimon Kefa in the Hebrew. And the first time we hear about Peter coming to Joppa is in Acts chapter 9, when Dorcas, we know that got sick and died, and Peter was called to come from Lida, from the city of Lod, which is not far from here. And they, they begged him not to delay his coming, to actually haste his coming all the way to this place. And we know that Peter was there and, he's, and uh, 
Peter arose and he went with them in verse 39. And then when he had come, they brought him to the upper room. Interesting how an upper room serves once again a role in Peter's life. And Peter put them all in, outside and knelt down and prayed. And, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. In Hebrew, Tabitha, kumi. And uh, she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when uh, he called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And he became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed on the Lord. So it was that that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon, who is a tanner. And right here, we found a place only place that makes sense for a tanner to live and that explains why tradition attached to that place as the place of Simon Tanner's house because if you're a tanner you must work on animal skins you must have fresh water you must have fresh water and being right by the Mediterranean it's kind of hard to find it but right there we found a well and the well leads to a reservoir of fresh water under the ground ground water fresh water and from the very beginning, people pointed at that particular house as Simon Tanner's house, as we can see. Today, there is a, an Armenian family that lives there, the Zakarian family. The place is locked up for visitors because of some petition of the Muslim community that this should be a mosque. It's interesting, every holy site for Jews or Christians, later on Muslims built a mosque there. Sometimes just by the presence of mosques, you know what is holy for the Jews and Christians. <laughs> and one of them is, of course, of course, Joppa is not mentioned in the Quran. Of course, that house is not mentioned in the Quran. Of course, it's not part of their faith. But of course, it will become when it's holy to the Jews and to the Christians. And so, this is the place of Simon the Tanner's house. And Peter stayed there. And he was on the rooftop. And it was noon. And I promise you, in Israel, with a Mediterranean diet, you will be hungry at noon. You eat good vegetables and good cheeses and great bread for breakfast, but it keeps you all the way to lunch. And then you're hungry again. And Peter was hungry. And he was on the rooftop and he was praying. And the Bible says that he got into what we call a trance. He fell into a trance in verse 10 of Acts 10. And he saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound on the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, No so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again and a second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object then was taken up into heaven again. I love Peter because he's so much like many of us. First, we don't believe, and we act in disbelief. Then we believe, but we become holier than God. We know what God wants. And when God is wrong, we correct him. <laughs> you, you see, Peter knew exactly who is talking to him. He may have not known what it's all about, but he stuck to his religious belief and tradition that I will not eat any unclean food. Foolish Peter, at the moment, he was still thinking that it's all about the food when it wasn't all at all about food. You know, we can be Christians, we can be believers, we can have the Holy Spirit, and we can still keep a certain capacity of religiosity in our lives. And we can say no to things that God wants us to say yes to. And we can abstain from things that God actually wants us to experience. And I'm not talking about weird stuff. I'm talking about the basic things. And, and, and I know that there's a lot of churches that will have a hard time when somebody 
uh, full of tattoos or long hair or or maybe I don't know shorts uh, uh, pants or walk into a church maybe for the first time in his life instead of giving him the gospel and the love of God they'll kick him out now I'm the last person to encourage tattoos and all of that but I'm saying the person already has them and he's seeking God and goes to the house of God maybe for the first time in his life who are we to kick him out oftentimes I'm thinking what would Jesus do and when Jesus came one of the first things that the Pharisees accused him for is what hanging out with the sinners so Peter is now receiving that amazing revelation and Peter uh, it took three times it's very interesting how Peter is what we say gave the first oxymoron in the uh, New Testament no so Lord <laughs> how can you how can God be your Lord and you say no to him it's an oxymoron but but with Peter it was a genuine oxymoron it, he truly believed that God is talking but God is wrong and he needs to you know he needs maybe it's a test Maybe it's a test, so, uh, you, hey, I am a very, very good Jew. I will not touch it. You know, it's interesting because I investigated the kosher dietary laws of the Jewish people. I, 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 I truly investigated it because I wondered, why would God, the creator of the earth and the heavens, the creator of all things, would care if I eat pork? I mean... To go that to the smallest detail of my life. Why would he care if I eat shrimp or squid or crab meat or, uh, or, or all of those things? And, 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 and then I realized that we are missing out the whole thing. It's not about anything but the love of God and the care of God for His people. And He wants them to be what? Healthy. If you really think about it, the two most contaminated groups of food in the world today are the pigs on earth and the seafood in the bottom of the ocean. Pigs can eat anything and the sea, the, all the, 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 shelf, the shellfish and all that, they, they actually are known as the, as the um, vacuum cleaners of the ocean. Now, I, I, we're free from the law. But we have to remember what was originally the reason for which God gave us those things. And Peter did not think about the love of God. He did not think about the care of God. He did not think about the protection that God wants him to have from these germs. What was he thinking about? As a Jew, I'm not allowed to touch it because I'm a Jew. That pride was still there even though he was already saved, even though he had the Holy Spirit. We, we can be full of pride and arrogant sometimes without knowing. I sat on the plane next to a, a woman from Brazil and I told her I'm a believer, I'm a Jew, but I believe in Jesus. And she started asking me in Portuguese, which I don't speak Portuguese, so we had to communicate through certain words. And, and I asked her, what is she? She said, wait a minute, so are you evangelical or, or Protestant? I said, well, I'm a Jew, but you can count me on that side. And she said, oh, I'm Catholic. I said, okay. She said, evangelicals? She said, it came after. It's the Catholic Church that came first. And I was thinking, and I said to her, the first church, they were all Jews. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 but after it became Catholic, I said, you see, you said after. Yeah. So I can say after also. It's not about after or before. It's not about who was there first. It's about what is the right way. And isn't that interesting? That in one place, God says to the Jewish people, don't touch it. Speaking of the food, by the way, and when he's bringing that sheet, he's telling Peter, kill and eat. It's the same God. But we have a revelation 
in the New Testament. That that which came from heaven was not a picture of food at all. And it was not a picture of touch it or don't touch it because it's healthy or not healthy. If it came from God, guess what? It's good. It, the Bible didn't say it came from a Greek restaurant all the way. The Bible said that white sheet came from heaven. God sent it. And by the way, Peter knew it. What God calls clean, we cannot call unclean. Unbelievable. And I want you to know that to the best of my knowledge, most of you who sit right in front of me belongs to that group of those whom Peter will count as unclean. You are the jumping shrimps. <laughs> you are the wild, slimy, creepy. I, no, no, I'm just trying to show you what the Jews had in their mind then, even when they were thinking about you guys. He, a Jew would not set his foot into a Gentile's house. And by the way, for a good reason many times. Because they always, always worshipped uh, pagan gods, were eating stuff that was offered to pagan gods. It was indeed unclean to a certain degree. And this is why when, when Peter eventually got it and went along with those soldier that was sent by Cornelius to take him all the way to Caesarea, a day and a half, two days walking distance. The first thing that happened when he walked into their house, they all bowed down and, and started worshiping him. And he said to them, oh, mama, I knew it. That's exactly what I didn't want to happen. He said, get up, I'm not God. Don't worship me. Because in the pagan world, they are not used to the invisible, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent God. They're used to see sculptures, people. They need to have the visuals. And Peter walks in, probably the messenger of God. Look what they do to the Pope today. That same mindset, pagan mindset of worshiping a human being is up until today in the world that calls itself Christian. And I want to wrap it up right now just with one message. The obedience of Peter led the first non-Jewish family to the Lord in Caesarea, a family of Italians, because Cornelius was of the Italian regiment, the Bible says, a pasta eater. If you don't like pasta, it's your problem. <laughs> and I want you to know that Cornelius was a Gentile that loved the Lord, but he had no idea how he can get saved. And God heard him. And God saw him. Yes, he was a non-Jew, yet God cared for him. And God saw him, and God looked at him. And God, in a dream, says, Cornelius, I've heard you. I've heard your prayers. I've seen the alms you're giving. I know your heart. Therefore, send guys to Joppa and get Simon, whose surname is Peter. And he's there in Simon the Tanner's house. And bring him over. He'll share with you the good news. And Peter... I'm thinking, I'm guessing, did this. <laughs> all right, I'm going to have to do it. I'll do it. And he walked all the way and he stepped into a Gentile's house and he shared the good news and they all got saved. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happened is Peter is, is dumbfounded. He had never seen anything that, now bear in mind, He's seen people resurrected from the dead. He's seen people who are blind seeing now. He's seen amazing things. But he had never, ever seen Gentiles 
accepting the Lord. In those days, to see a Gentile becoming a believer in Yeshua and Jesus was a great thing, unseen things, unbelievable thing. How sad it is that today it's the opposite. Today when a Jew becomes a believer in Yeshua is, oh wow. But in those days, they were all Jews who believed in the Messiah. And they shared. Watch this. They shared the spiritual things with the Gentiles. I want to tell you something. It is a riddle to many people. But in the book of Romans, in chapter 15, not only that, Paul in chapter 11 speaks of the importance of Jewish people in the plan of God and in the eyes of God. But in chapter 15, in verse 27, Paul is sharing something interesting. Paul says in verse 25, but now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. He's going to Jerusalem to minister to the believers amongst the Jews, the saints, the Jewish believers. And look what he says. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution to the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. Now look, in verse 27, I'm giving you an enigma. I'm giving you a secret right now. I'm giving you actually a mystery. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. Why? For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to the Jews in material things. By the way, in other translations it says, for if the Gentiles were shared by the Jews, then they should share with them the material things. Peter shared. You know, Peter says, gold and silver and gold I have not. But I can give you Jesus Christ. He wasn't a rich man. You don't have to be a rich man to save souls. God saves the souls. You, have to, you just have to share. And Peter, all he did was obedient to the calling of God, which was very inconvenient, unorthodox, very, very strange in his eyes. And Peter took the message of salvation to the most odd, inconvenient, he's non-territorial, and he shared it with the people he thought they're the least. Bear in mind, from there the gospel took off. From Caesarea, the, the harbor of Caesarea was the pump of the gospel to Asia Minor and later on to Western Europe and then to the whole world. The obedience of one man on, on a rooftop in this very city, right here in ancient Joppa, produced faith held by millions of people around the world today. Not limited to one city or to one country or not even to one continent. So, if you're looking at the tribe of Dan, the disobedience can not only hurt you but also generations to come. But if we're looking at Jonah, and certainly if we're looking at the story and the life of Peter, to obey is better than sacrifice. And I want to make it very clear. God is not looking for religious people. God is not looking for people who can say, I did not do that, I did not do that. God, look at me, I kept this, I did that. All that God wants is people that will obey Him. It's very simple if you really think about it. You really don't have to do much. You just have to obey. But isn't that interesting that that's the hardest thing for a human to do is to obey? From Genesis 3 and on, sin entered the world because of disobedience. And now, through Jesus Christ and the shed blood, on the cross, we can have that obedience. We can get rid of that disobedience. 
we can have, because we are now new creation. We are now people with new heart, new mind, new understanding. Now we are people of God. We can call Him Abba Father. We have direct access to the Holy of Holies. We now understand the Word of God. We understand the heart of God. We understand the love of God. And we understand the grace of God. And when you understand the love of God and the grace of God and the heart of God, you know that there is nothing in you that caused God to love you. It's all about free gift. And when you understand that even if you'll be the most religious person in the world, it's still not going to cause God to love you more than He already loved you when He sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross for you, then you understand, wait a minute, it's not about me, it's about Him. And all I need to do in the little time that is left for me on this earth, before the rapture comes, and the rapture is around the corner, guys, is to obey. God doesn't need sacrifice. God doesn't need fasting if it's not... What is, what is a true fast? Isaiah writes, to set the captives free. How can someone be free? He who has the Son, the Bible says, is free indeed. That's the only freedom that we can have in this world. And so, you give them Jesus, you set them free, and then you are walking in full obedience, the calling of God. I don't believe there is one person on planet Earth that doesn't have the calling of God upon his life once he becomes a believer to share the gospel. Oh, I don't think I'm ca capable. Oh, I don't think I'm talented. Oh, I don't think I have the time. I don't have the money. I don't have the, time, the, 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 the attitude. Guys, God is going to ask all of us one day, what did you do with the money, the time, and the resources, and the talents that I gave you? Every one of us has a talent resources and time now trust me if you have time to be on Facebook you have time to evangelize if you have time to you know to to watch TV you have time probably to evangelize if you have if if you have a tongue if you have lips if you have ears you probably can talk if you can talk by the way someone once said we should always preach the gospel and if necessary we should use words to preach the gospel is not only by talking. In fact, live as Christ lived. Reflect His love and His grace through your life, then people will ask. They will, they will be drawn to you. So, I want to encourage all of us today, here in the heart of the city of Joppa, a city that is at least 4,000 years old, from the heart of Joppa, we just learn a lesson on obedience. And may God will bless and direct each and every one of us in the way we think and respond to His calling upon our lives. And remember, you may be found religious, but you can <laughs> correct your ways. Because He's going to call you a second time and third time. And once you get it, act upon it. And sometimes things will f sound weird to you. God, should I talk to that girl? Are you sure? Oh, yeah. Talk to her. Talk to him. You won't believe it. How open people can be if we only talk to them. How lonely people are. I get hundreds of messages every day on Facebook, on emails, on on, on different platforms of the social media, people are lonely, people are desperate, people want to know the love of God, people know, want to know the plan of God for them. But all they need to do is be in the Word, trust the Lord and listen to Him. Unless you surrender your life, unless you are born from above, born again. You know, the first birth means nothing. Everybody is born first time. The second birth means everything. And it's the second birth that not everyone gets to experience. The first death, everyone, most people will have. It's the second death we want to escape. So we need a second birth 
so we can escape the second death. And in order to do that, we need to respond, to obey, to believe, and to follow God. If you really think about it, it's not that hard. All it takes is humility, and all it takes is um, to soften our heart so we can hear Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for a lesson on obedience that we can have both from the stories of the tribe of Dan, a lesson of disobedience and the consequences of it, and of course from the lives of Jonah and Peter. And maybe Jonah being such an inspiration was the reason why Peter was called Peter bar Jonah, Peter son of Jonah. We, we thank you, Father, for the lives of these two great men. We thank you for the difference that they made. We thank you, Father, that all you care about is not sacrifice. It's not religion. It's not tradition. It's not how we are for us to focus on who you are. To obey is better than sacrifice. We thank you, Father, and we bless you this morning from the heart of the city of Joppa. And whoever listens to this message, whether it's here now or back home watching this DVD or online, Father, reveal yourself to all people who seek sincerely your ways May they all understand that it is only through Christ and Christ alone and through having been born again from the Spirit that they can have a new, new life, new heart, new mind so they can hear the Word of God and that your Word will not be anymore on, on books but, also, but actually as Jeremiah the prophet said in chapter 31 verse 31, it will be written on the plates of their heart. We thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Comforter. And we thank you for your great promises that we have if we indeed obey you. And we ask all of this in the name of the one who obeyed you all the way to the cross. The one who said, not my will, but thy will be done. And that's what we want to say today from the heart of Joppa. Not our will, but thy will be done. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people say, Amen.